<laughs> Greetings. Welcome to the American Antiquarian Society's hybrid program, Black Women Poets Respond to the Brown Film Archive. We are coming to you from the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community who remain in active presence here in central Massachusetts. I'm Debbie Hall, I'm founder of Worcester Black History Project and also an AAS council member. Our mission at AAS is to cultivate a deeper understanding of the American past grounded in the primary sources we have been collecting since 1812. In addition to welcoming researchers from around the world to the user collections, both physical and digital, we host programs like this evening's that features the fruits of that research and provide insights into the past and its resonance for our own day. We thank everyone for joining us this evening. And as a nonprofit organization, we welcome any support you can provide to help us keep this work going. So thank you in advance for any donations. For those of you who are joining us on YouTube, Amanda Kondek, program coordinator, will be posting links and relevant information in the chat throughout the program. We will have time for questions and conversations later in the program. This program is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel next week. It is now my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Kimberly Tony is the coordinating cur cur curator, curator, I'm sorry, for Native American and Indigenous Collections at Brown University Library. Mm -hmm. During her tenure at AAS as head of reader services and director of Indigenous initiatives, Kimberly worked with the Brown Family Collection. She created a video for the Worcester Black History Project on William Brown and authored an article for Past is Present on Martha Ann Brown. Mm -hmm. Ashley Wonder has been writing and performing spoken word for over a decade with dynamic passion all over the Commonwealth. She teaches workshops to various age groups, hoping to inspire audiences around her to know that healing and liberation is possible. Reverend Dr. Catherine H. Reed is the author of four books of poetry, Crossing Boundaries, Between Midnight and Dawn, Sankofa, and Fire Goes Out Without Wood. She was a former associate pastor of John Street Baptist Church and a retired chaplain of the College of the Holy Cross. Jolanda Thorpe is a spoken word poet from Worcester. She graduated from Boston University with a degree in biological anthropology in January of 2020. During her time at BU, when she was not examining primate samples, she wrote short <laughs> stories for Charcoal Magazine, a student-led publication. In 2021, Jolanda's poem was chosen for the African Burial Ground National Monuments Still I Rise tribute to Maya Angelou. Please welcome our panelists. Thank you, Deb. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us in person and virtually tonight. Um, I'm excited to just give you a brief introduction to the Brown Family Collection before we move on to what you're really here for, <laughs> which is hearing from our esteemed poets tonight. Um, and I have uh, my colleague Elizabeth helping me um, to show off some of the materials from the collection. The personal correspondences, newspaper clippings, photographs, deeds, and other official documents, receipts, and printed books from a family's personal library make up what is called here at AAS the Brown Family Collection. Um, the personal materials that live in the archive span across several decades, centuries, in the family's history, offering a window into the personal and political lives of Brown family members and descendants between the years of 1762 and 1965. Um, and you see here portraits of William and Martha Brown. So the collection is named for these two, uh, a married couple living in Worcester by the 1840s. William and Martha Ann were activists, community organizers, and knowledge keepers within the city's Black community. William Brown, born in 1824 and who died in 1892, settled in Worcester from Boston as a teenager. Brown worked in Worcester as a highly successful upholsterer, drapery and carpet maker here, and operated a business with his brother Frederick for a time. Business records, receipts, upholstery stencils, uh, like you see here, um, advertisements and stencils. 
can be found within the collection of the family's materials. William Brown additionally held two patents, one for a sofa bed, um, which I think we can show you here. Sorry, I'm rushing you along. A <laughs> There's so many good things to look at. Lots of folders. Can we zoom out a little on this? This is a big one. Uh, so this is a patent for a sofa bed. I'm going to talk a lot slower now. <laughs> and a second patent for uh, a fruit picker, which has little to nothing to do with upholstery and drapery making, but there it is. Um, and this fruit picker, uh, the patent for which appeared in an issue of Scientific American in 1867. At age 44, Brown was inducted as a member of the Worcester County Mechanics Association and a portrait of Brown will soon adorn the walls of Mechanics Hall in downtown Worcester. I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> Um, William Brown served as a recruiter for the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, an African-American regiment of soldiers in the Civil War. In the papers, researchers will find several letters written to William and Martha from friends and extended family members who had gone off to fight in the war. Many of the letters mention the women in the Brown family specifically, remembering Martha Ann Brown fondly. Um, and here are just um, some examples of letters that may or may not be difficult to, to read. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote from some of them anyway. In 1863, John Johnson writes from South Carolina, I had much rather be at home where I could taste of your mince pies and chicken pies instead of eating salt pork and hardtack. I should like to step into some of your parties, Martha. Tom Freeman writes, tell Martha to send me or bring me some homemade gingerbread or some knickknacks. And in another letter, Myself and Alex Hemingway did think of coming home Thanksgiving time on a furlough, but you must all think of me Thanksgiving day eating salt pork and hard tack, <laughs> but that's all right. I suppose Aunt, Aunt, Ma Ma uh, Aunt Martha sent me a box by steamer and the contents made me think of my once happy home with you, with our family. And when I think of it, tears will come into my eyes. Those were happy times. In addition to missing the joy and comfort of home, the letters are heart-wrenching in their discussions of the effects of war and sadly the wartime death of one of the letter writers. The soldiers were right to remember Martha fondly in their letters home and the Brown family collection offers a window into the life of Martha Ann Louis Brown. Throughout the collection of photographs, mortgage and deed documents, correspondences, newspaper clippings, and genealogical documents and other materials, Martha is always there. It's clear that she provided for her family and her community. Um, I believe this is a, a one of several mortgage documents that Martha appears on. Um, Martha Ann was the only non-white member of the Ladies Benevolent Society in Worcester through the mid 19th century and was active in organizing dances and benefits for Worcester's black community throughout her life. Presumably these were the parties that the letter, letter writers were writing home about. Um, in 2019, when, over 100, when about 130 books from the Brown family's personal library were donated to AAS, researchers learned even more about Martha and her family. It was clear that Martha and her female descendants specifically were directly responsible for curating, sharing and preserving the family library, the intellectual lives of the family members for generations. Martha kept a commonplace book, similar to a scrapbook between the years of 1847 and 1849 um, until just about, just before her marriage to William. Within the pages of the commonplace book, you can find press botanicals, this beautiful page here. Um, the book is, is in fragile condition, so we can't be turning pages, but we found some, something pretty to show you. And also um, Elizabeth photocopied um, an image from the front cover, the inside cover of the book that notes um, who, who used the book. Um, 
yeah, within the book, you can find um, Press Botanicals, original poetry by Martha. The book was also passed down into the hands of at least one of Martha's granddaughters, Martha Jane, who made her own additions to the book. In other books from the library, we find sweet notes in the margins and drawings made by Martha Jane and another of Martha's granddaughters, Bernice, who was an especially talented visual artist. You see, there's one of her drawings added in. This one we can turn the pages, so I'll show you. Here. Martha Jane and Bernice may also have been following an example of their mother, Emma Griffin Brown, who decorated the margins of a book of poetry in the 1890s with personal penciled notes like my favorite poem are quite true. Emma started writing in this book before marrying into the Brown family and continued to write, use the book <clears throat> after she wed Martha and William's only son, Charles, um, whose photograph is actually in the ex exhibit case there. So please take some time to look at those materials too. Uh, she married Martha and William's son, Charles, and gave birth to Martha, Jane, and Bernice. Those sisters donated the family's carefully preserved papers, photographs, and portraits to the AS in the 1970s. Bernice Brown married Dr. John Goldsberry, and we're honored to have a number of the Goldsberry family members in attendance with us tonight. In 2019, they entrusted to AS's care a second donation, the Brown family's 19th century library of hundreds of volumes, many of which are inscribed or annotated. Just showing a lot of them because they're great. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorites from 94. Um. For over 150 years, the Brown Family Library had lived at the house William and Martha built at 4 Palmer Street in Worcester. And many an inside cover of each book is inscribed with the family's 4 Palmer Street address presumably so that those who borrowed books from the family home would remember where to return them. <laughs> Beyond functioning as a community lending library of 19th century books on poetry, civics, history, politics, and more, the family home at Fort Palmer Street was known to be a site of respite and refuge for community members and visitors. In the early 1850s, the family helped Isaac Mason, a black man who had fled his enslaver in Maryland, find work and lodgings upon his arrival to Worcester. The Brown family and their descendants hosted visits from Frederick Douglass in the late 19th century and from Langston Hughes in the 20th century. Upon hearing of Martha Ann's death in 1889, Frederick Douglass penned a letter to William Brown at his Four Palmer Street address, sending his condolences. In it, Douglas writes of Martha, I had few friends of the early times whom I remember more vividly, and I may say lovingly, than your dear departed wife. Now here at AAS, as it once was at 4 Palmer Street, we welcome the community into conversation about the lives of the Browns and their descendants. And we welcome the poets on our panel tonight to share their reflections on the material that lies within the Brown family collection. So I'm gonna hand it over to our poets with Ashley. Hi, y'all. Hello. Uh, so as I was preparing for this, I was talking with uh, members of my family and the Price family, my older great aunties, and they knew they they gave their own recollections of like the someone in the Brown family. And I was like, oh, is this true? So I'm like, I don't. And I was uh, doing the research that, that they gave us. I'm like, OK. So it's really cool to, to know that uh, the impact of generations upon generations um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that before I get into the poem. So what inspired this one was the purple flowers. Oh, look at that. there we go. Look at, I love it. Go ahead. So this first one was inspired by the flowers and it's also my favorite color. So an 1800s book captured of a pressed purple flower, regrettable love, some to cherish, eons ago of a different English spoken in a way of the tis holding the pages reminded me of a withering tree. It was something to be admired, a love of something ordinary 
like a handwritten note just saying hello, a forgotten romance of stirring hearts in a world now over flooded with instant access communication. Maybe they had it right back then. <coughs> a love was perhaps easier to find to get to know someone. It is something to say of having generations of a family to witness a free black man survive wars, a blessing sent from the patriarch himself, Frederick Douglass. Maybe it's the passage of time that holds all of this in glory. I believe every family wants to be remembered for greatness. The city where roots find you made something sparkle while you were here that speaks volumes. We are aspired to do the same, to leave a mark like a pressed flower on someone's heart, that someday someone will find a deeper meaning in the loves we were able to share and what we left behind. So my second poem was, I just wrote this second poem like Monday or something. So, <laughs> um, artist life. <laughs> uh, it's it's a pantoon poem. So for those that are watching online in present, if you don't know what that means, it's a very difficult type of poem to write because there's guidelines to follow and it has to be very strategic. So, okay. Oh, what inspired it? So you got context. <laughs> uh, the information they sent us in the emails, I took out certain words that really hit my heart. What, the community with the library, with the, the pages that were falling apart um, really hit me and that's what inspired it. So when you hear words like calming or preservation or deterioration, that's very specific to the rounding of the poem. There was nothing common about this, outpouring to community through the greatest gift of books, learning. To live a life as such is a deterioration to be unrecognizable preservation. No limit life legacy leaving anything bound uncommon. Outpouring to community through the greatest gift of books, learning, we all should attain this. No limit life legacy leaving anything bound uncommon. Our memories will be called ghosts to those who knew us. We all should attain this. To live a life as such is a deterioration to be unrecognizable preservation. Our memories will be called ghosts to those who knew us. There was nothing common about this. Thank you. You know, I had a hard time at first reading this collection, writing uh, poems about it, because I like to really know a person. I don't like to write about a family if I don't know them. But the more I looked through the pages, the more I saw the drawings, even though I didn't know the family, I knew girls who would, you know, something would speak to them and they would write it down or they would draw on the margins of books. So uh, it's a little bit broader. It's almost like a commentary of all of us through the archives. And my first poem was, I realized how important and how specific we have to be about capturing memories of our families, how if we don't, it can be erased so easily. Um, so this is a poem about that. They built their homes in our shadows and claimed it was never ours because even in our reflection, they don't see darkness and living in our cast, they still feel warm. Do they ever wonder why the sky stays a yellow green and there's no need for night to come there anymore? We were sick of kids chasing streetlights home. So we painted the sky with spices in our cupboard. But some of those kids didn't have finish lines. We left our, door, we left our doors open, praying that the heat would lure them, but my warmth drew in many things, including you. And despite being a pest, I'm told I'm responsible that I have to carve a whole you size because it feels right. Because it feels right to feed something, to give it a home, but I don't want to own you if I have to take from my own. The second poem, I was really inspired by those pressed flowers. Um, I thought about how they can tell us so much about 
things in our lives, happy moments, sad moments, but also how we're taking them from their organic space for our own needs. And I thought about how we sometimes as people can, can be like that too. Um, so what if she's a pressed flower in a book, fragile, beautiful, stomped between two heavy overbearing hands, drying out to make herself art in these blank white pages. She grows in between lines of paragraphs like dandelions in between spaces. What if she becomes a moment in time, bringing the reader back to a world that she once knew before she was plucked? A world where grass grows tall to protect all the little flowers from the beating of the white sun. And then this last one is a bit of a prose, a bit of um, poetry as well. And it's based on the drawing in the book I read quite a few pages and it goes on about this girl who is so angry at this boy. She's so upset. She's even ashamed a little bit of her own anger. And I thought about how I felt that at a time. And I know so many girls felt that at a time. And I'm sure the draw felt that as well at one point. She had one of those labors men say God gives women to remind girls not to move too fast in this world. Some say her stomach swole so large she couldn't get out of bed. Others say the baby punched so hard it left fingerprints on her flesh. The story changed airs like coins, but truth be told, from conception up until the last minute of birth, she was alone. Many resented her for keeping the baby fatherless, but in reality, there were too many fathers to count. She could trace each, each donor like the freckles on her face. And although it was not her fault for getting pregnant, they said it was her fault for keeping a burden she couldn't name. But the name was simple, in fact. It was anger. When she felt the weight of her child in her arms, she knew her anger was hers and hers alone. She fed it whenever the baby wanted to eat. And some say you must put a child on a schedule, but the body knows when it needs nourishment. And she slept with it. And others say, you gotta give a baby independence but that child was herself. She bathed it because she knew how dirty babies get and how sick they can feel. And she knew how angry dirty gets, how dirty angry gets and how sick it can make her feel. And after all the feedings and nights of sleeping and the baths, she was finally at peace with her anger. It wasn't love, it wasn't love, but it was a realization that the baby grew separated from herself, that her child didn't need its mother and she didn't need her anger. Good evening. My work is a little personal uh, because of the relationship. And I think you'll understand as I go along. Mm -hmm. Years after Martha Brown's death, Dr. John Goldsbury Jr. and his wife, Darista, donated over a hundred of her books, portraits, photographs, letters, and papers to the organization. I feel a great kinship and honor to be part of this Black woman poets respond to Brown family archives because in 1973, Dr. Goldsbury was my sister's doctor at Rutland Heights Hospital, treating her after she jumped from the third floor burning building. She was left bedridden, unable to walk, talk, 
or feed herself for over four years before her death. As a family, we are indebted to Dr. Goldsberry for his excellent care and understanding. He was a true physician for all of us and recognize how essential faith is in our lives. He allowed me to take my sister out of the building, out of the hospital building, to a prayer service, healing service for my sister. And he made sure I had the help I needed to bring her there and back without worry. No, she was not healed but my heart was at peace. He knew how important that service was to me. He was a medical doctor that understood and valued hope and faith. So you see, I have some history with this family. Memories have surfaced while working on this project and would not cease until I gave birth to this poem, and it's called The Message of the Sunset. And I just wanted to add that I'm in ministry, and it's because of my experience there at that hospital. The Message of the Sunset. She rolled her eyes, turned her head away. Every visit, she would glare at me. And this went on for quite a few weeks. One day I walked in singing. She just stared. The lady in the next bed waved at me. I went over and sang to her. On my next visit, when my sister saw me, she smiled. One Sunday I felt so weary. I did not think I could make the drive. I thought of her without a visitor and went. When she saw me, she had the biggest smile. I kissed her on the cheek and started singing. On my way back home, I stopped at Mount Wachusett to rest and pray. Tears streaming, I looked up and there was the most stunning sunset. Strength restored, I made it home. Two days later, the hospital called to tell me my sister died. I said, you must have made a mistake. I saw my sister Sunday and she was fine and went to see for myself. There was no mistake. On my way back home, the tears came. Grateful tears, grateful for that last visit. This next poem, I, uh, I had a little problem with it at first. <clears throat> The following words of Martha Ann Brown, it says, I'm only happy when I'm alone, brought to my remembrance, the painting hanging in my wall at home that says, when you find me here, do not think me lonely, only alone. And that was by Eileen Lynch. And the problem that I had with that poem is because of all of the things that Martha Ann was involved in. And I thought that, you know, she would be out there. And she was most happy when she was alone. And that's how I am too, but she's so outgoing. I didn't think that would be her, but. So this poem came forth because of that. I am only happy when I'm alone. When you find me here in the early moments of the day, alone with my thoughts, alone with my memories, alone with my God, 
Don't think me lonely, just alone. You and you alone are my refuge. You prepare a table for me in the midst of turmoil. I seek your face and lean on your everlasting arms. My life is in your hands. Guide my steps, lest I stray or fall when you find me here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. One day I'll get used to this. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Can we get another round of applause for all of our poets? Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Amanda, I know you're monitoring the chat. But now it's time for conversation and questions. <laughs> so do we have any questions from the audience here? I can start with the first sure. one. All right, so this is from Nazira Wright. And she asks, as a frequent researcher of the rich collections at the American Antiquarian Society, I love seeing this amazing panel of black women poets respond to the Brown Library Project. How will the AAS use the Brown Library Project to attract more Black women artists and scholars to the reading room and to the fellowship programs? That's a great question. I don't know if any of us are this. There might be someone. We, there might be someone here. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. Do you want to, Elizabeth, do you want to you say something? Yeah. Um, so, Nina, do you want to go up to the podium? <laughs> it's almost like Nazira set us up with that. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank Nazira. You. Um, we actually are just launching this fall, but it will take place, uh, the deadline for fellowship next spring, um, a brand new fellowship um, called the uh, Brown Family Collection Fellowship. Um, we're very pleased to have, uh, to, to announce this and to have members of the family here. Um, this is something we um, have wanted to do for some time, and we're finally putting it into place with this collection. Um, is, it seems to be the, the best way to, to make that happen, and we're really looking forward to, um, to seeing the applications come in. So thank you, Nazira. That is one thing that we are, are doing, and we're very much looking forward to, um, to the response that we get. Um, and I think everyone can attest to the, the great collection here and the, the many things that it has to offer. Elizabeth, do you want to add anything about the, the nature of the collection and, yeah. and the many things that, that you've brought to researchers already from the collections? Sure. Um, I'd just say- you want to come up here maybe? Sure. Yes, for the <laughs> virtual audience. Okay. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Pope, curator of books. And um, uh, this collection has been my favorite to um, add to during my time here. And uh, there is content in the Brown Family Library for almost any project. I've um, brought it out to people working on Sunday schools, on um, uh, the Quran, on, um, now I'm gonna think of any examples, <laughs> um, but there's, there's something for everybody in this collection. Um, it starts you know, early in the um, 18th century and goes through the early 20th century. Um, you have annotations, handwriting, um, you have uh, books written by black authors. Um, it's a fabulous collection. And um, with this fellowship, the idea behind it is, is that um, it honors the Brown family and this um, collection, we hope that people will use it. And we hope that they will also learn about all of our collections, the richness of them um, for studying African-American history, indigenous history, um, we have uh, some projects on Black self-publishing, some other projects that we'd love to see more widely, um, uh, be more widely known and, and have the collections be used by people who could um, benefit from them. So we're thrilled to, um, especially to see scholars and um, people in the community using the collection. Um, it is for all of us. It has been saved by uh, family members for 
all of us. And we're thrilled to see this kind of community engagement with historical material. Um, we don't always get to see that. We think it's amazing, um, but we get excited when we can see people in the community, new people coming in um, who are as excited as we are about these materials. So thank you. Please do apply for the fellowship too. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm interested, and I heard a little bit about your process and what kind of inspired you, but Ashley, if you can expand a little bit more on, I mean, I think it was the first thing I know is the press flowers in the book, but can you tell us a little bit more about kind of how you were moved by the material you looked at? Oh, yeah, and the, the email, um, I guess it's good metaphors. <laughs> um, I, I really like the, the idea of living your life in a way that you gave everything away, so to speak. Um, going up in the black church and all that, you kind of taught like you give yourself away so that other people are inspired by what you do and what you give back. Mm -hmm. Jalanda, I know you mentioned how you, what you were inspired by, but can you expand a little bit? Yeah, I think for me, it was just the everyday and the familiarity of feeling like I know that person writing in the book. Um, so I, I definitely took a, a broader approach, but I think that's because with as I read and as I looked through the pages, I knew so many girls and I knew so many women. Um, and that's where a lot of my poetry came from. Wonderful. And Reverend Dr. Catherine Reed, you had a personal connection, so which was really moving that Dr. Goldsberry was the person who looked after your sister, intended to your sister. You want to say more about that? We do have members of the Goldsberry, uh, yeah. <laughs> the Brown family descendants. One of the things that uh, when I first started writing, I was writing about Martha uh, because she touched me. She was so outgoing and um, nothing seemed to bother her. And I was the exact opposite. Uh, and I was writing about her life and I kept on. And all of a sudden I realized I'm supposed to be writing a poem and not her life. <laughs> so that's why I said I was having problems in the beginning. I had pages of things about her. <laughs> She really, she really touched me because going to, at that time, to be able to work with other people, and I was so shy that I really couldn't understand how she could do it. Mm -hmm. So that, that is what made me... Uh, have problems trying to find something to write about because mm. I was associating it with Martha Ann Brown. Mm. And Martha Brown is fascinating to me, the work she did. Kim, can you tell us a little bit more? I know you did a piece on Martha Brown, but a little bit more about her contribution to Worcester society. I know she was part of a women's club um, and she was the only woman of color at the time, black woman. Um, can you say a little bit more about Sure, yeah. yeah. Um, I think a lot about that one particular fact about Martha that she was the only non white member of the Benevolent Society. Mm -hmm. So she was working in, in these spheres um, of being that point of, I guess, representation for when you think about in that time, in the mid 19th century, there probably was <laughs> what she was doing a lot of work on her own in a way. And a lot of the, you think about sort of the emotional labor that women of color perform on a daily basis today, you can imagine maybe what Martha was up against at that time. So I think about that a lot when it comes mm -hmm. to her. Um, I also just think about, um, I imagine her not knowing her, just sort of thinking about her based on what was left behind. Um, I imagine her to be sort of a knowledge keeper, um, sort of that matriarch who's helping the family function in these ways. So the parties that people are writing back about, the, the food that people are writing about, back about, that they remember Martha for all these things that she did, feeding them, um, signing mortgage documents for her son um, to have a home to live in and, and these sorts of things. So. Um, you get a real sense for sort of the sort of abstracted idea of who she was based on what was left behind and thinking about 
the books and the collection and how women in the family were engaged with the sort of intellectual life of the family and that Frederick Douglass wrote a letter um, mm -hmm. about her specifically remembering her really fondly in, in what you imagine is a large universe in his life of people mm -hmm. that he had met and interacted with that Martha is remembered fondly by him too. That was particularly impressive. <laughs> Frederick Douglass mm -hmm. writing a letter yeah. and thinking about women as the keeper of stories mm -hmm. and history and records. Sure. Yeah, we have another virtual question here from Wynne Kelly, who asks, I noticed at least one item in the book collection about Black presses. Did the Browns read or subscribe to any journal, journals in particular, and does their reading show how they related to Black literary culture? <laughs> um, I don't know of them subscribing to any um, Black periodicals, but I am assuming they did. Um, they were very well read. They were very um, engaged intellectually in their local community, but also in the um, uh, wider Black community, especially in Massachusetts. They went to colored conventions. Um, William Brown was at those. Anybody who knows about the colored conventions project, um, if you don't know about it, check it out online. Um, but uh, they were engaged in these conventions of people of color coming together to talk, what should we be doing politically? Um, how can we impact um, uh, our representatives? Um, ask questions specific to um, uh, black concerns. You know, How do we uh, get this done or that done? Um, so they participated in those events. We know um, they certainly bought quite a bit of books. Um, so I'm sure they bought the periodicals as well. Um, it's just, they don't always survive as well. Um, especially if they didn't get bound together. That's one of the nice things about a book. As much as this one is um, suffering, we're going to give it some conservation treatment. Most books, they, they are pretty sturdy and they can make it um, a good long time. So we're thrilled to have the books and to have that knowledge of, of that part of their reading. Um, but I assume it was a much larger universe than we will know. And I think a lot of the poetry kind of reflected on this idea of what remains, you know, that we don't have the whole story we have pieces. And I really appreciated that theme coming through, but it felt like most of the poems. Confirmation is what I call it. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know what we were all going to write. So I always like wonder how is it gonna come together? Mm -hmm. And like, it, it does what it does. So. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Anything you wanna add? Yeah, sure. Is anything known about Langston Hughes? connection? Not more than just that he visited at maybe the family knows more about that. I'd love to, <laughs> I'd love to do a Brown family oral history project. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I've, I've just read sort of mention of it in um, some other documents that actually live outside of this mm -hmm. collection. Yeah. What and, if he was having a reading locally or right, something? Yeah. Right, so um, there were a lot of speakers coming through Worcester. Um, we, you know, Frederick Douglass came through as a speaker. Um, uh, Sir Jordan of Truth is speaking here. There's a lot of, um, uh, you know, really interesting and important um, Black folks coming through Worcester. Um, also, I just wanted to mention, this isn't quite what you asked, but um, uh, we do know the Brown family was uh, very engaged with um, formerly enslaved people who were um, uh, establishing themselves as um, uh, needing careers. Um, they, the family took them in, housed them, um, uh, got them started, taught them upholstery business, um, set them up as upholsterers um, sometimes as well. So there are a number um, of narratives of formerly enslaved people who mention the Brown family. Um, so Lunsford Lane um, does Isaac Mason, who's another um, person who they helped uh, significantly. So um, we don't always know who stayed at the house, but we know there were a lot of people staying at the house. And if you look at the census records, I mean, you're only catching it every, you know, five or 10 years, depending on if you're looking at federal or state, but there's always different people in the house. Um, really fabulous um, to be able to, that's one of the things I'd like to do if we're talking about, you know, an oral history when the family would be fabulous. And I'd love to go through and um, see everyone who stayed at that house that we could find out. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Any other questions? I I I sure. uh, I want to say thank you. This was really amazing. Thank you very much. Um, I I want to know if there's from each of you if there's one word that in your mind captures um, 
maybe the impact of the Brown Family Archive that you could give us as poets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, transformative is what hit me, transformative. Mm. That's a really hard question, um, <laughs> but the first word that came to mind is familiar. I just reminds me so much of my grandmothers, my aunts, my mm. friends. Mm -hmm. The word that uh, would come to me would be togetherness. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Open your house to the books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You make me answer that. <laughs> <laughs> you want to answer, Kim? Um, I, yeah, just, I thought about like representation, sort of akin to what Jolanda was talking about, like connectedness. Mm -hmm. You also said, I think, Kim, right? Yes. Um, um, that Martha Brown was always there. I wrote it in my on my my notes my phone i didn't want to keep writing because i think people would think that i'm on my phone <laughs> <laughs> it happens when you're writing notes on your phone people look at you i'm like well, why are you on your phone um but you said that martha brown was always there. and that just stuck out, you know it just stuck out in my mind as someone who was always there um you know meaning that where whatever the situation whatever the circumstances, she's there to give aid, she's there to help. Uh, she's there to make it make it happen. Yeah, that's that's how I saw her when I was looking through the archive in terms of where she appears. Mm. Um, I think it was beyond just sort of being nice and asking after Martha in a letter, there would be more sentences about um, how Martha is, how others in the family are doing and, and sort of remembering mm. um, the influence of this person, which, which Sort of the way, and, and that she just is, is appearing in documents or is referenced in other letters and things like that. Mm -hmm. I love Martha Brown. We have a question. Uh, what was the Worcester address of the Brown family as recorded in the census records? Or Palmer Street. <laughs> if you've looked at any of the books, you see that everywhere. <laughs> and of course, the three I've pulled don't have it, but <laughs> they, <laughs> most of them do. <laughs> Other questions? That, that house is still there, by the way. It is. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if you wanted to share a little more about. <laughs> Come on up. Come on up. James was at an event earlier today at Mechanics Hall, so he was given dropping some knowledge there. Um, keeping my mouth shut next time. <laughs> so the house on uh, Four Palmer Street is still there. In fact, it was in our family through 2019. So uh, we recently just sold it. So um, when my cousin passed away, who was the last family member in the home, uh, we went to uh, clear the house out. And that's where we found this whole second set of material. And, you know, if, if you've ever cleared out a house that your family's owned for 175 years, <laughs> you can imagine there's a lot of stuff um and we're, we're really grateful for uh, uh clark university and the Amer american antiquarian society for bringing the expertise to tease apart what is truly valuable versus what is maybe not and um you know so we're just grateful that we were able to as we turn that house over find this material and um and move it on so we're, we're glad to see the home has a new family and we hope they can start another 175 year history of, of uh, wonderful stories out of that, out of that, out of that house. So uh, yeah, if you're interested, it's still there for Palmer Street. <laughs> and there's more material um, in the collections too. There's the mortgage, there's um, information about building the house. Um, there's information about repairs at the turn of the 20th century. So if you are interested in architecture or this idea of family homes, that's another thing that could be studied with this collection. So we are honored. I know, James, you gave a presentation this morning, right, about the history. So we are honored to have descendants of the Brown family here. Do people have questions? If I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know you gave a presentation. And Yvonne, I won't put you on the spot, but please feel free um, to maybe say more or you can ask questions. And you too. Are you, are you descendant? Because you look, all of you are looking. <laughs> <laughs> 
and I kind of know Yvonne, I'm not going to embarrass you, <laughs> just a little bit, um, but just the connection with Martha uh, being artistically inclined, whether poetry or drawing, and your um, inclination to draw a paint uh, when we talk. I just found that fascinating, kind of how Black women in general just were able to be artists and had the luxury to do that at a time when most Black women couldn't. You know, it just taking care of everybody, right? Um, and being revered by um, people at the time. Um, so I love, I do love Martha Brown. <laughs> I wanna know more about her. We only have, do we only have one picture photo? Are there more photos of? It's only one I know. That's only one. Yeah, picture. Sure, yes. I was doing a little research and I read that she had purchased a piano in um, maybe around 1860. And I was wondering, did she play piano or who in the family played piano? And um, was it an upright or was it a grand or does anybody know anything about the piano? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody plays piano. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Do you know what her piano, what kind of piano she had? There was an upright in the house that yeah. we believe is that piano. Yeah. Uh, oh, wow. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Any other questions? I can, I'll share a little story. Oh, Come on up, Eva. <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother, who's Bernice, that they mentioned earlier, um, would tease us. We'd go visit at the house, and there was a chair, upholstered chair, and she would always say, you know, Frederick Douglass sat in that chair. <laughs> and we'd say, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> right? We called her Baba. Right, Baba, right, Baba. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we came through life going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, they knew Frederick Douglass. The books come to the library, and Elizabeth, that day that we came, and she, you know, laid that letter out and we all were like oh. <laughs> it's true <laughs> we sat in that chair we felt horrible that all these years we kind of said uh-huh uh -huh. like so if you did an oral history you'd hear a lot of that kind of thing where we're sort of like oh well, i don't know but these are the stories that they told us so um just a little snippet but thank you so much thank you And we want to thank you all for joining us. Once again, I'm glad everybody was able to be here. And those who are watching uh, from home, thank you for joining us. Take care, everyone. Have a good night.